Ask any five-year-old to draw an animal and they'll do it. Ask a high schooler to do the same thing and chances are they'll tell you they can't draw. So what happened? Does creativity leave when we reach a certain age? Or does it become less useful to us over time? We should talk to someone about this. Let's dive deep into creativity and see what we find. Yeah, that's a good question. I think that's the right place to start. Um, people, I think, on their own, they have their own kind of pocketbook definition of what they think creativity is. But when you sample people, you get a smattering of all kinds of answers to that question. Creativity is probably anytime you use your imagination. Producing uh, original work. Creativity is just a way of expressing. I really think it depends on um, the person's experiences. It depends on their talents. Probably doing something on my own. Making something without the help from external, possibly books or other people or whatever. Kind of something that, like an idea or something that you have inside of you um, and making it extra, whether that be through, through music, um, through like art, drawing, painting. To me, that's creativity. I'm making, I'm making something that comes from my mind. I think creativity is bringing something into the world that to your knowledge hasn't been there before. Most researchers, most scholars who study creativity settle upon this definition, that something is creative if it's novel, if it's useful, and if it's socially valued. Now it's not that those three criteria aren't without um, controversy. People debate those issues all the time. But essentially, something being novel, useful, and socially valued is what is seen as you know, creativity. Okay, now that we have a working definition, let's talk to someone who truly embodies creativity. My name is Megan Lunen, and I do all kinds of art. Um, so I actually have a degree in graphic design, um, which opened up a lot of doors for me of learning different kinds of art. Um, now I'm just kind of in a fun phase of I can do what I want when I want to um, and learn at my own pace, which has been really fun. So I paint, I enjoy painting. Um, I've started doing graphic art on my computer um, and learning how to do that. I have a pottery wheel, so I've been fiddling around with pottery. Pretty much all our decorations are homemade because it's me screwing around um, and creating things. There are numerous projects that I have that are not finished. Um, and if I'm being honest, I have no idea when they will be. Um, there's a, almost a functionality that's coming into it now of, okay, if I'm gonna make this painting, who am I giving it to? or um, if I'm going, like, what is something ceramic wise that I could make that I could use around the house if it's a vase or um, something to hold my jewelry in or a gift to give to someone. The greatest joy I have after I get the item made is to give it away. My name is Bernie Nakazel. I am 79. I love to do woodworking. I found an interest when I was growing up on the farm. I was probably eight, nine, ten years old when I made a uh, first project, actually, um, for my mother. I had seen in a magazine a, um, oh, it's a picture, in fact, I got it right here, in my opinion, um, Swan. I thought, well, that would be something nice to give my mother to hang on the wall. So I got some plywood and I traced it out, I cut it out, I painted it. She loved it. <laughs> so, I mean, woodworking can be a job, but for me, it's, it's been a hobby. It's, it's a very rewarding. I think it keeps the mind busy. It's a challenge to me. I love challenges. Um, so I got to get my, uh, put my math skills to work as far as angles and whatever, but it doesn't always work and it shouldn't. But there's always that learning thing. You make a mistake, 
okay, better start all over or make some revisions. And to me, that's a challenge. And this is, this is what I love. I think in this culture, there is so much emphasis on success, on uh, achievement, on perfection, that I think we don't spend enough time talking about how do you get there. And you get there by failing multiple times. Amelia and Rick currently work together at UNI as journalism and photojournalism professors, but their partnership began decades ago. We met at the University of Missouri, Columbia, and uh, when we graduated, uh, we had a little bit of time that summer in 1997. And so we, we went to Bulgaria uh, for a couple of months. We had both graduated uh, with journalism degrees and we were very idealistic and very passionate about our, our craft, our chosen profession. And we wanted to do a joint project over there. And we decided that what would be best for us was the rose industry. And Alia was very familiar with it having grown up in Bulgaria. We had picked a story that was an off the beaten track story. It wasn't um, a story that was sensational. It wasn't a story that was very um, controversial. It did turn out to be a wonderful project for, uh, for a writer and a photographer uh, because it was visceral, um, uh, you know, very, very photogenic, uh, lots of different scenes and situations and places to photograph. And through the work, uh, while we were there, it soon became apparent that the story was more than just a, a story about the rose industry. We happened to be there uh, eight years after the Berlin Wall fell, and Bulgaria was transitioning from a state-run economy uh, to um, a market-driven economy. They were going from communism to capitalism. And uh, so Analia's interview started to focus on that. And then when I got home, when I started editing the pictures, I started looking at the pictures in that larger, broader context. And that's um, how this show really, you know, formed. We call it Tales of the Bulgarian Rose because it, take, it tells the story of the everyday people who um, pick the roses, who work hard in the fields, whose lives were very much impacted by the transition at the time. You know, you research, you, you find the connections, but once you get to the field, you evolve as the story evolves. Keeping an open mind, um, making yourself open to the opportunities that, that emerge every day. I see pictures and, and I feel very strongly that they are gifts that are given to you uh, and you only have this one moment to see it yeah. and and if you if you don't capture it the next there is no next time i cannot tell you how many times i've made that mistake of thinking i'm going to come back and i'm going to photograph this or i'm coming i'm going to come back and i'm going to re-interview this person and it never works journalism is what the kind of work i do is you have to seize the moment yes. Yes. and you just cannot let it um, kind of fade away or just kind of go through your fingers and then it's gone. After talking with some highly creative people, it's clear that creativity is not limited by age or craft. For this next part, we'll pivot to a topic that's different from, but closely connected to creativity. Flow is a term that was coined by my mentor, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. I wrote a best-selling book called Flow, the Psychology of Optimal Experience back in 1990, uh, which was based upon, up to that point, 25 years of research trying to understand, better understand, the role, the place of enjoyment in people's lives. What do people enjoy and how do they experience enjoyment? And one of the things he quickly and his students in his lab quickly came to discover is that it seems to be inherent within our nature as human beings to experience enjoyment when we're in a situation where we're performing a task that is at a high level of challenge for us to do, but we have a level of skill that meets that challenge. So it's the challenge is not way over our heads, it's not way beneath us, but there's this meeting of challenge and skill. And when that happens, 
and when you have very clear goals about what you're trying to accomplish and a very clear goal in that experience as you're doing something, um, whether it's you know playing music or writing a paper or delivering a presentation, when you have a very clear goal for yourself, you, when you get immediate feedback from the experience itself, you know when you did well, you know when you didn't do so well and you need to self-correct you know, and do better. Oftentimes there can be this experience that we have where there's this almost automaticity where it just feels very natural what to do next when you go from one moment to the next to the next to the next. And it can be a very ref just a rarefied kind of an experience uh, for people and we know that it's very much true in the arts, it's very much true among creative people regardless of whether they're in the arts or not. My name is Luke Foster, um, I'm 22 years old and I'm in charge of all the production here at New Covenant Bible Church. I, I do a number of things. Um, my main task every week is just to get ready for the Sunday services or whatever services we have going on in the week. Um, so I do a lot of stage setup and teardown. I do programming of lights um, and, and our soundboard um, to get them ready for volunteers to come in and use uh, throughout the week. I would describe myself definitely as more of a, the logical, analytical type of person. I, I have a creative side to me, but I, I look at things from like a logical standpoint. Um, I, I like to think about like what's the best option and why, um, what's going to be the best solution to this problem. And I, I oftentimes look at that from a like technological, analytical standpoint. What are the numbers? Um, why is this worth putting time and effort and resources into? A couple of things that happen, we know when people are in flow, is that time disappears, or is very much distorted. Hours might pass as if they're minutes. Self-consciousness disappears. You're no longer thinking about you know, how you look, what people are thinking of you. You are just so in the moment um, while you're experiencing that, that pure presence in the moment as you're engaged in whatever it is that you find challenging and that you love for its own sake. Working in my everyday job, I oftentimes find myself in a flow where, um, where I'll get started on one task and I'll finish that task. And then I, and I, I love what I do. Um, I get excited about my job. And so oftentimes I can really find myself lost in what I'm doing, just going from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, the next thing you know. Um, I'm through a whole day and it, it just flew by and I've gotten you know X number of tasks done in that day. And I look back on the day and, and think, wow, I, this was a really productive day. So not only am I the tech guy here at the church, um, a lot of people may know me as a tech guy, but a lot of people also know me as a drummer first. Um, I've been drumming in the church uh, since I was in sixth grade. The, the people are, are in another dimension, almost another world. Like I, I kind of get lost in my own little bubble up there. I have the music in my ears. Um, I'm doing something that I love. I can totally just get lost in it all. It's super easy um, to do that. So it's kind of funny, would seem kind of surprising. People who do creativity research, and there is a large scholarship of creativity, um, it, isn't, it is a, a research endeavor, there are a number of creativity journals, and people who study flow, which is studied in all kinds of domains, people in all kinds of occupations and, and um, areas of life, uh, they have their own research, and very, very rarely do you see something an article or do you see a book where the two intersect. The creativity people do their thing, the flow people within positive psychology do their thing. In spite of that, even though it's very siloed you know, in the academic world, the influence of flow upon creativity and creativity upon flow is immense and probably even immeasurable. People who are doing something where they're creating something that is novel, that is useful, that is socially valued. If they love what they're doing, they immerse themselves in a project, in a task, and there's a clear goal and immediate feedback, they are much more, they're very likely to experience flow and experience that 
Some people describe it as a rush, that intensity, that pure experience where you love what you're doing. And what happens is it's about motivation. They're intrinsically motivated to want to re-experience that. And the way to re-experience it is to increase the level of challenge a little bit and increase your level of skill and increase your challenge and increase your skill. And as you do that, you experience more and more momentum. And you flow becomes, it becomes this engine really that, that drives your um, your, uh, your motivation, you're intrinsically motivated. You know, if you don't have you know something in your life that does that for you, um, it's going to be tougher. It's going to be a it's going to be a much more um, blasé, you know, boring kind of a life. So having something like that that does that for you, that gives you that opportunity to experience flow, is of tremendous value. The moderately sad thing that people get wrong is they assume that other people are not creative because of how they present externally. They think that guy with the suit and the tie uh, asking them if they've uh, filed their TPS reports can't possibly be creative. And the very sad thing is when people assume that they themselves aren't creative because they've been told so. I think most people have creativity and at some point in their journey have squelched it. And it might be dead, it might be something that could be reawakened, but when people say, I'm not a creative person, I think, oh, please. Doug Shaw is a math professor, and to my knowledge, the only math professor who also directs improv shows, teaches classes on improv comedy, and leads workshops on collaborative creativity. Collaborative creativity is where you create something with somebody else or a group of people. And the thing that really fascinates me is, because this is something I do workshops on. I travel the land doing creative, collaborative creativity workshops. And when you create a piece of writing or storytelling or art as a group, no individual would have created that thing. And sometimes with the collaborative storytelling, people are laughing with delight at this amazing story that came out. And then I say, could any of you have done that? And they're like, no, no, this is... So then my question is a spiritual question is, well, who did it? We have a piece of writing or art or story here. Who made it? Basically, if you're my friend, you're indulgent, right? You're gonna just deal with some stuff. Uh, so one of the things is whenever I go to a restaurant with my friends, I always have a legal pad or index cards. And there are a few games I like to play at the table, not for the whole meal, but hey guys, let's do this, right? And so uh, then when I went to this applied improvisation conference, it turns out that other people were doing similar things. So I was like, I'm not the only freak who likes to do collaborative creativity at the dinner table. And I started picking up games they like to play. And then I started kind of making this little list of, I called it restaurant improv, which is collaborative creativity that can be done between the time you order food and the time that food comes. And I just called that, well, that's restaurant improv. And uh, I got enough that I started saying, you know, I should write a book. And then I was told by several people, restaurant improv is a lousy name for the book because it has nothing to do with restaurants, so not really improv either. Dr. Shaw's work in writing draws a lot from his experience with improv theater, but does this experience overlap at all with his role as a math professor? I would say improvisational theater overlaps with every damn thing. Uh, what you bring to the table when you are improvising on stage is your entire life experience. And if you do it a long time, as I have, everything eventually winds up coming out in that soup. I was told I couldn't do any of these arts again, I think it'd be really sad. Um, yeah, actually, you just even asking the question made me really sad. I feel I have good equipment. I, I keep it in good shape. I keep blades sharpened, uh, everything lubricated. I rely on it. I look forward to going out to work with it. But if suddenly it wasn't there, whether it was destroyed by from natural you know, fire, storm, stolen, yeah. It would be devastating, very, it would. I think I would find ways to be creative in different ways. Um, something that I've been really enjoying is caring for plants. Uh, I have a lot of plants in our house right now. 
Um, and I've actually been volunteering at the greenhouse on UNI's campus. So and I, honestly, I think that's a form of creativity as well. So I probably lean into that a lot more. <laughs> Ultimately, I'm a, I'm a part of a bigger picture here working at the church. Um, the church itself has a mission. We have a vision for that mission. And my area, um, being the live production area, I fall under that overarching mission. Live production, I'm, I'm serving the worship experience, um, which is ultimately in place to, to help kind of push the church's mission forward. This is the University of Northern Iowa, and we are beset by a lot of education majors, right? That's kind of our thing. So a lot of people in my improv troupe that I directed a dozen years ago were education majors. Then they all do this horrible thing that you guys do and graduate and leave me. But then I got started getting contact from people who had been in my improv troupe who were madly successful teachers. And they were like, yeah, the education courses were important, but that improv group really helped us. People in the business world who had some improv training were kicking serious ass. So the tools of improv, that training, applies to day-to-day -day success in business. There are people who are using improv to help people with dementia. They're helping people who have severe trauma. People with autism who don't feel safe expressing certain emotions and stuff, but when they're playing characters, they feel really safe to explore this whole world and uh, so autistic kids really love doing improv and it really helps them in their day-to-day -day life. It really is an engine that drives the evolution of culture. We are living in the world that we're living in today with all of our conveniences and all of our luxuries and all the stuff around us, good and bad, really because of creativity. There are other factors as well, but what we have is a result of individuals and teams and businesses and communities identifying problems that have to be solved and coming up with novel solutions that are better than the previous ones to, to solve that problem in a way that is useful and socially valued that, that people like. I documented um, an Italian neighborhood in St. Louis. What I did is I photographed the neighborhood then I went back in and I interviewed uh, residents by showing them the pictures and have them tell me stories. And what I found out uh, is that my, what I considered my best photojournalistic pictures that sort of fit this photo, the photojournalistic conventions, they, uh, they hardly elicited any responses at all. The, uh, the residents, what they really responded to were very simplistic pictures of houses and streets, something that anyone could shoot. That phrase that creativity is this thinking outside the box, it assumes that creativity is just about thinking. If you, it's, it's a cognitive act. And that's only a very, very small part of creativity. That's not essentially what creativity is about. I think creativity is about seeing the world or seeing a, a problem in a way that's different from the way that others do, of tapping into part of yourself that is unique and has something important to contribute, you know, using your talents and your power to really have an impact upon the world around you and that includes your body it includes your, your 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 affect it includes your ability to relate to others it's not just about thinking you know if um, if the songs that you know we think are part of great music were a result just of thinking we wouldn't have very very good songs if creativity were just about thinking we would have a very very um, dull world you know creativity is much more than that